And we're in the Psalms, and, uh, and I have a lot that I want to share from Scripture. Um, and at the risk of saying something you've heard maybe once or twice before, I would ask you to consider this verse again deeply. For God so loved the world, the world. Tonight's message is from Psalm 96. Worship with joy and declare the one true God. Psalm 96, a psalm of David, is for the world, for the world. It speaks of a Savior who comes for all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave, he took the initiative, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We believe here at Freedom Ministry that uh, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, receiving him as Lord and Savior, is the only true way to complete freedom over addiction, over besetting sin, over life-dominating sin. The Scriptures make it very, very clear Every human being uh, comes into this world born into the kingdom of darkness. That is a spiritual darkness, a spiritual death. That is a life where you are self-centered. We're created in the image of God. We're created to be dependent on God, who's infinite in all his resources to satisfy us. But when we come into this world, we are turned inward. And we still have eternity placed in our heart, but we're looking for the answers in our own heart, which... Our, our own hearts are not infinite. We cannot supply the need we have. Augustine said that we all have a big, giant, God-shaped hole in our hearts. So we believe here firmly, and we're not ashamed to say that we believe that coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and getting a new heart that is not self-centered but is God-centered, we believe this is the only true way to freedom. That's what we believe. Psalm 96 is a psalm about singing a new song to God. Singing a new song to God. Let me read another verse from Scripture that you've probably heard many times and is so important to us. Romans 8, 28 to 32. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good For those who are called according to his purpose, all things, especially the hard things, especially the painful things, especially the suffering things, we believe, this is what the scripture teaches, that the Lord will only allow things in your life that will mold and shape you for your good. We are being conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our good. That's what it means when all things work together for our good. Our good is to be more like Jesus. And God is molding and shaping us all the time, especially through our difficulties, to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means he, every single day you wake up, every single day his providence has arranged for you to get knocked around and to get buffeted and to get challenged so that you keep saying, Lord, (laughs) could you help me please? You know? This is like, I'm, I have no peace, I can't love this person, I need wisdom, etc. We believe this is called providence. And so every single day, every single born-again Christian should be receiving messages from God that say, look, look to me, look up to me, not to your problems, look to me. And so we should continually be saying, okay, Lord, it's game time, I'm weak, you're strong, I'm not very smart, you have wisdom. I can't love very well. You do. I'm pretty rough, but you're gentle. All day, every day, we should be turning to God in our need. And he says, let's do it. I'll shape you and mold you. What does that mean? What does Psalm 96 say? Let's read Psalm 96. It says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. A new song. How can you keep coming up with new songs every day? Because every day you should be (laughs) receiving grace. He's willing to give it. Are you asking for it? That's the deal. That's how it works. 
It's a process the Bible calls sanctification. A process whereby the Lord allows things into our lives through his providence in order to mold and shape us, to use us also to bless others. And that's what this wonderful psalm is about. The need to continually recognize the Lord at work in our lives. We know in the Old Testament it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I thought for such a long time when I was a baby Christian, then a middle-aged Christian, now as a Christian for more than 30 years, I know that's true. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And life is hard. And life hurts. Life is difficult because sin has twisted everything, and I still have a part of me that's twisted as well. And so I find that... (laughs) If I keep looking to him, that's when I can have this joy. When I look away from him and focus on my problems and my, uh, my own finite resources, uh, there's no joy there because you've got to keep looking up because that's where you get all the answers. That's where you get the power. That's where he directs and guides you. So when he's guiding, directing, empowering, helping his Holy Spirit working through me, I feel that joy. <laughs> And that's powerful. That's called living in victory. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We start with this call to worship. This call to worship God with a new song. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. That means praise His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. That is, the, <laughs> that is a command. Proclaim. That means to tell other people. We might say there's a a sin that uh, I'm guilty of. Now, I'm in ministry full time, and I am guilty of the sin of silence, the sin of not proclaiming the thing that is everything to me, the person that is everything to me. I'm guilty. I don't proclaim Jesus Christ like I should. I should not be ashamed of having the answer to to the world's problems, should I? Why am I sometimes so quiet a lot of times? No, we're told proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare, proclaim, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the peoples, We're having the uh, Olympics now, aren't we? Glory is a very difficult term to define biblically. Glory. Watch the Olympics. You will see glory. You will see people who have struggled, trained, sacrificed everything for 10 seconds in a running race. You will see people... They have overcome diseases and broken bones and broken lives so they can compete in one game and overcome and be victorious. Watch the Olympics. You'll see the human spirit like you don't see it in a lot of other places. You will see glorious demonstrations of the human spirit. Now, if that is glorious, if we're inspired by these Olympic athletes who have overcome so much and we're like, whoa, man, that, oh, that was glorious. Did you see her? What she's done, and do you know what she had to go through? What's happening in her country? She still can train, and she still come. Oh, my goodness. That is glorious. The glory of the Olympics pales. It's nothing compared to the glory of God. Infinite. (laughs) Infinite in his amazing traits and qualities. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all the peoples, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Above all gods. And I forgot to do my... One moment. The Lord, our God, is one. He is... Exodus, chapter 20. God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He can bring you out of slavery, to addiction, to besetting sin. You shall have no other gods before me. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I will repeat myself when I come up here because I believe he's laid on my heart many of his great truths. God doesn't want uh, your information. He wants your heart, right? That's why we're, we're told to pray without ceasing. He wants your attention, just like a little kid, right? Just like a little kid that won't leave its mother alone, right? The mom's trying to get the breakfast ready, trying to get this ready, do that, and a little kid keeps bugging her. Why? Because a little kid loves his mother and he wants her above all things. He wants her attention. God is like that. God wants our attention. He's a jealous God. He won't allow any idols in our life without us being disciplined. So it says here, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. The word God's there. Well, in the next verse, it says, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. That in the Hebrew there, that is a, a form of uh, God's name in Hebrew, but it's a, an emptiness, a, a God that seems like something important, but is actually empty. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. There we go. That is the difference, right? If you go in the Psalms, you will read over and over about the gods that are made out of metal and wood, and they have to be pulled on a cart, etc. They tip over. <laughs> Our God has created the universe. He's awesome. When you try to measure the universe, you, know, you ever see those scientific things where they say, and this many billions of lights a year is away as another galaxy, and then there's 10 billion of those. And I mean, the universe is so massive. Someone said, why would God make the world, the universe, so massive, and yet only one place seems to have life? To show us. <laughs> how small we are compared to him, to give us a perspective of his grandeur, right? He is awesome. Verse 6, honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty, the beauty of his holiness. Did you ever meet a person who loves the Lord, who's sanctified, who's been with the Lord walking for some time, this process of becoming more and more like Jesus, more and more sanctified, more and more that means to be set apart for God's use. Right? Those people are beautiful. Jesus, wow. We know what the Scripture says, there was nothing physically about him that would have been appealing to us. He looked like any other man. But if you spent a little bit of time with him, oh, you would have, you would have said he's the most beautiful human I've ever seen in my life. True beauty is about holiness, and the Lord is truly beautiful. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. So God is great. He's the creator of all the universe. That's why he is the one who deserves to be praised. And now this is a call to the entire world to glorify God, to come and to worship God, to give to Him. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into this courts. And this is summarized now in verse 9. O worship, worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness, tremble before him. This is the introduction. You know that, right? We were just going to read through the, through the psalm first. And then we were going to go back. But I can see the clock isn't agreeing with me. So let me, let me get to the meat. Some more meat here. No one. If you lived in a place where there was a king, you would realize that nobody ever approaches the king without a gift. You don't do that. 
<laughs> you don't come before the king without bringing a gift. Exodus 25.2, God says, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. We are called to bring to our God, it says here, spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. The word there in the Hebrew was the word for sacrifice that was not a blood sacrifice. Do you bring to God your gifts? Do you surrender your life to God each day? I think there's a verse that says something about that. Let me see if I can find it real quick here. I think it's in Romans, right? Oops. Romans 12. This wonderful part of God's holy word. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy that he sent his only son to die for you on the cross. His son gave his life paid for your sins. In view of all that he's done for you, which is everything, (laughs) <laughs> right? In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. That's it. That is it. What's the Christian life? What's the victorious life? What's the secret to uh, overcoming addiction and besetting sin and life dominating sin? Remember the mercy of God. Remember you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies. That means all that you are every day. Your thoughts, your plans, everything. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Holy, again, means separate. You say, God, today I'm yours. Use me. And the thought of having another drink or taking another drug will probably seem so repulsive to you. The Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and say, don't go there. Don't do that. You've just given yourself to the Lord today. You don't need that stuff. It'll bring you down. And it will. I know. I was there. I did not offer my body a living sacrifice to God uh, that would please God. I did not worship him. This is your proper act of worship. You probably won't get to the end of the of the psalm. Well, we will. I will get to it. So your proper act of worship. This psalm is about singing a new song to the Lord because as it says in Lamentations. His mercies. What's mercy again? Mercy means I messed up again. Maybe it means I took, I had a drink today. Maybe I did a drug today. Maybe I lied again. Maybe I was proud again. Maybe I gossiped again. But lamentation says his mercies are new every day. <laughs> And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, when you realize that you've fallen down again, you've taken that drink or you've done that drug or you watched that pornography or whatever you did, you fell down again. If you confess it to him, it can be sweet again and he will cleanse you. And that's how it goes. That's how you have a life of victory in Christ. You're not called to be God knows that you're not going to be exactly, perfectly holy right this moment, but he's working on you. And he wants to have you continually come back to him. And so we're told to worship in this psalm, right? Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations... The Lord reigns. He's the king. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. 
and he shall judge the peoples righteously. That's a big one. Isn't that a big one? I know it was a big one for me in my addiction. Things didn't seem fair. Things didn't seem right. It seemed like I had to do something to sort of get the edge. Self-medicate. Because things weren't fair. Things weren't easy. People were getting away with stuff, and I didn't want to get away with stuff. And so I was got the short end of the stick. So I had to turn to some substance to medicate myself. Judgment is coming. As we walk with Christ every day, He's the one that will bring the judgment on the people that you think are pulling you down. (laughs) When you remember that there is a judgment coming and the God Almighty is a righteous judge, you can let it go. You can let it go. How many people are in addiction because of other people making them feel small and powerless and, 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 and ashamed of themselves? So they turn to drugs or they turn to pornography or they turn to something else. They sin. They go outside the, the boundaries God has set for a, a life that honors Him in order to compensate. And God says, you don't need to do that. I got this. I got this. Leave it to me. <laughs> They're not going to get away with anything. Judgment is coming. This psalm is very, very realistic. Say to the nation, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. And then the psalm goes out to nature itself. Out to nature itself. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the fields be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the world will rejoice before the Lord. For He is coming. For He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His truth. All of nature can't help itself. All of nature is going to rejoice at the revelation of the sons and daughters of God, it says in Romans, right? It says all of creation was twisted by sin. And all of creation is groaning, just like we do, by the effects of sin. And this psalm paints that beautiful picture of renewal. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. That picture where nature itself rejoices, where where trees are singing. I mean, this is an incredible picture of the joy that we should have as God's new creatures in Christ, right? We should also be like that picture we just read of tremendous joy because we are a child of God. We have been saved from our sins. We have been made new God is on our side now. And in addiction, in besetting sin, that's always the issue. I know it was the issue for me. What about me? Who's helping me? I got to take care of me. I got to do this. I got to do that. That's why Jesus said, come to me all ye that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's called victory in Christ. I want to finish up now. We taught out of a a book a while back in in, uh, Freedom Ministries, a book called A Banquet, which is usually a yummy, you know, a big spread, a big banquet. A Banquet in a Grave. Ooh. That book was about addiction, written by a great man of God, very, very profound insights into the world of addiction. Listen, I want to just read a bit from this wonderful book. The church changes our identity. Who are you? Who are you? Notice the difference between I'm Jim, I'm an alcoholic, compared to I'm Jim, I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation. 
a people belonging to God. That's from 1 Peter. For those who have put their faith in Christ, it is Christ himself who unites us. Wherever I go and I meet brothers and sisters in Christ, you can feel that family bond right away after a few moments of talking and praying and worshiping together, right? It unites us. Christ himself who unites us and defines us, not our race, not our financial status, not our hobbies or interests or particular problems. Our family, those closest to us, are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. When you come to Christ and you're born again, you get a new heart that's God-centered, liberated from that self-centered place where you were in so much pain. You get a new heart that is God-centered. And you're now with people who also have that same heart that's God-centered. And the ultimate in the body of Christ is a unity and then worship. Listen. When our core identity is alcoholic, drug addict, sex addict, we are saying that our problems define us. Our problems don't define us as born-again children of God. Jesus Christ defines us. (laughs) The King of kings, the Lord of lords, he defines me now. He defines me. So the the church teaches us to remember. It's very difficult to remember what is most important. On the surface, not getting caught, avoiding pain, having our independence seem the most important. With growing wisdom, we find that sobriety and self-control are very important, but it takes a special revelation from God and the reminders of His people to teach us that God is most important. God is most important. That's what Psalm 96 is saying. The whole psalm is saying, God, you're most important. I'm going to sing a new song to you every day. You have saved me. You keep me going. You're my destiny. You're everything. You're everything to me. God, you're most important. The church exists for the sake of God's glory. This is the purpose of all creation. This is demonstrated, we demonstrate that God is most important. Now listen, by our corporate singing, sing to God a new song, right? Sing to the Lord a new song. We demonstrate that God is most important through our scripture reading together, corporate prayer. This is where we find our identity, brothers and sisters, when we're here worshiping or we're someone else worshiping with God, devoted to Him, saying, here's my life. My brother and sister's with me saying, Here's my life, and it's powerful. That's the power of freedom ministry, because we have the same spirit, the spirit of the risen Christ in us that brings victory to us. And we do what the Bible says. We help bear one another's burdens, and we encourage one another in Christ to keep looking up, looking to Him always, singing a new song every day, being mindful of his providence, hearing the good reports from our brothers and sisters how God is working in their lives, even in their suffering, and especially in their trials. And we hear of a life of freedom, a life of freedom from addiction, freedom from besetting sin. These things are so important to us. They are all Christ-centered here. Let me finish. As we worship together, the Holy Spirit works in us. That's why we worship here first. We worship here first, it's kind of like, okay, let's get the electricity flowing. Let's get the hearts and minds focused. When we worship together, our hearts are pointed in the right direction, up towards our God. We sing a new song to Him. We say, hey, I I got a good report today. You know, when we ask up here in the front... Anyone have a good report? Man, every hand should go up. We're just not aware. Our eyes are half, we're half asleep. I know I am. So, God is making us new, right? God is making us new. It says in Ephesians 4, 24, like the God that is making us, he's making us new all the time in true righteousness and holiness. He continually will shape and mold us in this life of victory. Talk about addiction. When you start to taste that freedom of living for Christ, and you start to taste that glory of letting Him use you, you start to taste that joy that the Bible talks about. 
And if you do it enough and it doesn't take long, you don't want another drink. You don't want another drug. You don't want to go back to the old life that got you nowhere and took everything away from you. Now you got everything. Now you've got everything. This is, I want to read one last portion of God's holy word. Ephesians chapter 4. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, right? Oh, just have one more drink, you'll be all right. One more drug. No, those are deceitful desires. So, you are taught regarding your former way to put that off and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. That's what we're told in uh, Romans as well. Be not conformed to this world like you used to. Be not conformed to this world, but be renewed by the transformation of your mind that you might know God's will for your life and walk in freedom and light. There you go, right? Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. That's a huge part of being in the body of Christ. We all have been gifted. We all have something to share to support each other. That's critical. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That's what we try to do in addiction, besetting sin. We try to take care of our own needs ourselves. No, God has put us in this family, the body of Christ. We can help each other and God works through us all together. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's it. Don't grieve the Spirit. The Spirit wants to guide you, lead you, empower you, comfort you. Oh my goodness. And we grieve that spirit, the spirit, a person that dwells in us all the time when we're sinning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, how grateful we are to know that you love us the way you do, that you even would give your own son to die for us. Oh, Father, we don't deserve your love and your mercy, but we are so grateful for it. Help us, Father, to see your hand at work in our lives each day that we can sing a new song to you every day. Help us, Father, to keep our focus on Christ and not on our own selfish desires which are so deceitful still. Father, help us. Guide us, direct us. and Be with us now, Father. As we share our lives, help us to have open hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit, Father, that you might minister to us through one another. We'll pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.